Today on High Tech Shower International, we're going to visit one of the nation's leading scientific research laboratories. Located in eastern Long Island, Brookhaven National Laboratory houses some of the world's most sophisticated scientific instruments used by researchers from around the world. On today's program, we're going to focus on the groundbreaking biological research conducted at Brookhaven. From sequencing the human genome to visualizing complex proteins, we'll bring you all the details on this exciting work. I'm Tom Dory. And I'm Connie Lane. All this coming right up. After the Second World War, a consortium of Northeastern universities decided to construct a basic research facility that could provide access to expensive large-scale scientific equipment. In 1947, Brookhaven National Labs began operating, and researchers from all over the world came to New York State to utilize Brookhaven's unique equipment. For nearly 50 years, scientists have used the facilities for both basic and applied research. In a previous program, we profiled several companies which are using the intense X-ray radiation generated by the National Synchrotron Light Source. Exxon has probed the structure of millimeter-sized objects using X-ray microscopy. And both IBM and AT&T have used the light source to explore X-ray lithography for computer chip manufacturing. However, there is another side to the research at Brookhaven. Since its inception, the laboratory has had a dedicated biology department. In today's program, we're going to explore groundbreaking research in structural and molecular biology. Dr. William Studier chairs the biology department at Brookhaven. At the laboratory, he developed the bacteriophage T7 gene expression system. This system is one of the most powerful ways to express proteins, and it's widely used in academia and industry. The interests of the uh, biology department have developed along the interests of the supporting agency, which has been the, initially the Atomic Energy Commission and then the Department of Energy. So a lot of interest is focused on genetic effects, genetic effects of radiation or pollutants involved in energy generation. And uh, <clears throat> so the bulk of the basic research, the kind of core research in the department, is molecular genetics and structural biology. Dr. Studier's current research focuses on improving DNA sequencing. Several years ago, Studier and his colleagues began using some of the basic elements of the T7 system to develop a different approach to sequencing. And out of that work has developed a, a new uh, uh, strategy for sequencing DNA that we are quite optimistic will lead to, to uh, order of magnitude increase in the speed rate of sequencing and also reduction of the cost of sequencing. But when it's all put together, uh, it uh, has the promise of having the capacity to sequence the entire human genome on the time scale of the Human Genome Project. The major goal of the Human Genome Project is to sequence the estimated 3 billion base pairs of the human genome by 2005. In order to reach this goal, we need to vastly improve our ability to sequence DNA. Several public and private research institutions are working to devise new sequencing techniques. In a recent program, we told you about another Department of Energy-funded research institution working in this area. At Argonne National Labs, scientists have devised the sequencing by hybridization approach. Using radio-labeled DNA probes, they claim to be able to sequence 10 million base pairs a day. However, because this technique relies on probes of a certain length, it may turn out to be better suited to diagnostic purposes rather than large-scale sequencing. Dr. Studier's work is focused on creating a completely automated system capable of sequencing long stretches of DNA in a cost-effective manner. Because of the scale of the Human Genome Project, cost-effectiveness is equally as important as speed. Studier's technique is an improvement of an already existing method known as primer walking. This method starts with a long DNA template of unknown sequence and a short DNA primer which binds to the template. In order to get a better understanding of his approach, Studier gave us a quick overview of primer walking. DNA sequencing is capable of reading about 500 bases of sequence, 
but the template is usually very much longer than that. The problem is how do you get the blocks of 500 that cover the whole sequence? The answer is that the template sequence determines the position of the primer. So if you construct a new primer, that now will go to the, a new site in the template. Now you can read a new 500 bases of sequence. In order to ensure the primers are only binding to one spot on the DNA, the primers must be a certain number of bases long. Normally, they're 18 nucleotides long. This way, they bind to only one spot on the entire human genome. However, each 18 base primer costs about $50, and if they're only used once, this becomes very expensive. Studier's group has experimented with primers only six bases long. Since there are only four different bases, his group proposes creating libraries of all 4,096 possible Hexmer primers. These primers appear repeatedly in the human genome, so they can be used over and over. This greatly reduces the cost of primers, and since the primers are readily available, it also increases the speed of sequencing. The problem is that a hexamer isn't long enough for if your uh, template is 40,000 bases, say the size of a cosmid DNA, there would be uh, the, the same hexamer would occur, say, 10 times in there. But we have found a way enzymatically that you can use three hexamers in a row. So if you have three hexamers in a row, now they will prime specifically, uh, but you're doing it with a set of 4,096 hexamers instead of something like 69 billion 18 mers. The researchers are using a single-stranded DNA binding protein to prevent the single hexamers from binding. The set of three hexamers are able to form a stable complex and bind specifically to a priming site. To date, Studier's group has experimented with over 5,000 different priming sites, and the hexamers seem to be as effective as the 18 mers. So having the ability to prime at specific sites from a library of hexamers means that you can automate this process by having an array of 4,096 hexamers uh, a set of templates on which you're walking in parallel and a place for assembling sequencing reactions. So a robot could go take an individual template and the three hexamers that prime at the position on that template that you are wanting to read sequence and the robot can assemble reactions as fast as it is able. This uh, ability to assemble sequence reactions then means it would saturate any currently available uh, capacity for analyzing the sequencing reactions and reading out the sequence. So designing a system that can read sequences as fast as the Hexamer method can generate sequences is another challenge for the group. Currently, they're developing a capillary-based system that would be faster than gel electrophoresis. After each primer walking cycle, the capillary tubes are filled the sequences are read, and then the capillaries are emptied. A computer analyzes the sequences and then determines which primers are needed for the next step. This way, sequencing can continue without any human intervention. In order to get a feel for their progress, Dr. Studier gave us a tour of his labs. We now have the entire library of 4,096 hexamers, and we are able to do primer walking on small templates using a commercial fluorescent sequencer so that we're able to uh, start, or we are about to start a small production effort of uh, producing new sequence on small templates on a commercial machine. But our aim is to develop a much higher capacity working, walking on longer templates and uh, with much higher throughput. We're coming here to a laboratory robot on which uh, we have arrayed the 4,096 hexamers in 384 well microtiter plates, 11 384 well microtiter plates. But we're able to uh, pick up 
automatically from uh, any, any point in these 4,096 uh, wells, uh, hexamers for sequencing, and bring them to a place where, uh, where uh, sequencing reactions can be carried out. For reading the base sequences, Studio's group has designed a prototype capillary system. Over on this optical bench is the prototype single capillary system. When the uh, system is running, the capillary runs between these electrodes and under this microscope objective. The illumination comes from a laser and through this optical path to illuminate the capillary. In this single capillary prototype, light from the capillary is sent to four different photomultiplier tubes. Each tube breeds a different color, which corresponds to a different base. Studier showed us another system designed for eight capillaries. Eventually, they hope to expand the capacity to 96 capillaries, each being read six times a second. If the machine uh, is, uh, uh, works in the way we expect it to work, then any place could have it because it's, there's very little labor involved. There's just one or two people are needed to feed the machine. And uh, so it could be anywhere producing large amounts of sequence. So in fact, what we would hope would be there would be, you know, a dozen of these machines or so would be enough to do the whole human genome. One of the most important biological research tools at Brookhaven is the National Synchrotron Light Source. Constructed in 1982, this second generation synchrotron is one of the best sources of intense X-ray radiation in the world. In this synchrotron, electron bunches are accelerated to an energy of 750 million electron volts. The bunches are shunted through magnets and used to fill the ultraviolet and X-ray storage rings. Each ring has photon shutters which allow UV or X-ray radiation to be directed to research stations. Structural biologists use the intense X-ray beams to determine the three-dimensional structure of complex proteins. A crystal of the protein is mounted in the beam line and then the X-ray diffraction pattern is studied. Malcolm Kappel, a biophysicist at Brookhaven, gave us a quick overview of the procedure. So in practice what we do is we mount a small crystal here, align it to the beam optically. We have a little visualizer here to, that facilitates that. Then we rotate the crystal at a fixed rate, acquiring uh, short exposures over small angular displacements, and then record a series of diffraction spots on the image plate detector, scan them out, record them to memory, and then la later on they're uh, analyzed in terms of indexing the reflections, and measured the uh, intensity of the scatter spots. And from that, we can reconstruct the uh, three-dimensional electron density within the crystal, and in effect, the uh, atomic positions of all the atoms within the protein molecule. Due to a confluence of forces, the field of structural biology is in a period of exponential growth. In our continuing report on Brookhaven, we'll discuss these developments in detail. But for now, we're going to focus on one particularly interesting structural biology research project at Brookhaven. For over a decade, Dr. Joel Sussman has been studying the structure of a very important enzyme in the nervous system called acetylcholinesterase. This enzyme hydrolyzes a small neurotransmitter called acetylcholine. What's unique about this enzyme is that it works incredibly fast. It's capable of hydrolyzing 20,000 acetylcholine molecules a second. This allows for the propagation of 1,000 nerve impulses a second. Since 1986, Dr. Sussman has been working to gain a better understanding of this molecule. So one of the fears people have is that you work a year or two or three to determine the structure and there won't be any surprises. And this was not the case. It was really, really a lot of surprises. And the, probably the most shocking thing about it is that acetylcholine itself is a positively charged ion. So most of the studies before we did this indicated that the binding pocket in the enzyme would be filled with negative charge groups. And they aren't there. The neurotransmitter, which has to be hydrolyzed very rapidly, actually is buried, gets buried deep inside the enzyme, about halfway into the enzyme, surrounded by these aromatic residues, sort of in a place where you wouldn't have imagined someone would have designed, designed a, a molecule to do this. 
So by generating a three-dimensional visual representation of this molecule, Sussman's group was able to propose a new mechanism of action for the enzyme. Such breakthroughs are not uncommon in contemporary structural biology. Further analysis of the model revealed another fascinating feature of the molecule. Researchers have determined that the entire top half of the molecule is negatively charged and the bottom half is positively charged. So any positively charged ion, like acetylcholine, could be sucked into the active site of the enzyme. These are positively charged ions being sucked in as acetylcholine will be sucked in, going down to here. Once it gets here, this process has to be continued. It has to hydrolyze this molecule very rapidly, 20,000 times a second. There's two choices. One choice, it could be hydrolyzed and then try to go up through this extremely narrow route blocking the channel for anything else to come down, and then wait until that's done, the next one would come down. Or think of this as a production line, where the molecule would come in, be hydrolyzed, and go out over here, which is a possible backdoor. Sussman's current work at Brookhaven involves testing this backdoor hypothesis. By generating time-resolved X-ray crystallography images, they can simulate the enzyme substrate reaction. To do this, they synchronize the release of a substrate from the active site of the enzyme and then take X-ray images microseconds later. Only a few laboratories in the world could accommodate such experiments. Sussman's three-dimensional models are allowing many researchers to probe the subtle mechanism of this enzyme. One group of scientists at Cornell University has simulated what acetylcholine must feel like when it encounters this enzyme. Because of the neurological importance of acetylcholine, Sussman's research has interesting medical implications. Several neurological disorders seem to be caused by deficiencies in neurotransmitters, including acetylcholine. If it were possible to moderate the activity of this enzyme, so it wouldn't break down the neurotransmitter quite as rapidly for these diseases where there's a deficiency, it would be possible to elevate the amount of neurotransmitter and to improve some of the cognitive functions. One key disease like that is, uh, is Alzheimer's disease. The only commercially available inhibitor for treating early onset Alzheimer's is called Tacrin. Sussman's group has already generated an image of this molecule nestled in the enzyme's active site. By analyzing the position of this drug, Sussman's group has identified a variation of Tacrin that may bind to the active site more tightly. Also, they are examining a Chinese folk medicine that is a very strong inhibitor. Well, that's all the time we have for today, but be sure to join us again next week for the second half of our special report on Brookhaven National Laboratory. Thanks for joining us. I'm Tom Dory. And I'm Connie Lane. Bye-bye.